is your favorite cheap suit wearing podcaster. Hi, this is the first show of a double header, uh, one of two today. And if you haven't, well, this is episode 150. It's a milestone episode. First of all, welcome everyone to episode 150 of the Mike Maven podcast. Last night, if you were here yet, you got the chance to watch a great show on YouTube, of course, in the form of Miles Sun, retired federal agent, both with Border Patrol and Customs. The man did a, did a lot. Talked about a shootout at the border with a smuggler uh, who's coming in from Mexico. And uh, that shootout, it was interesting as it was hilarious not the shooting itself but the sequence of events that led to it and of course working in miami during the height of the cocaine cowboys era there was a lot of coke to go around and a lot of violent dealers selling it and a lot of undercover work too the man was in uruguay and venezuela as an attache as well so he led a life and he was on last night um for the mike the new haven podcast so as you know we mix it up here it's not relegated to one category or the other so from law enforcement we're going to go back to the news aspect of the show with my next guest excuse me who has been a constant tele television presence, I should say, in the tri-state area since 2004. So almost 20 years now that she's been in the business. A native of Wayne, New Jersey, originally just outside New York City, as she'll discuss. Uh, she graduated from Fordham University in the Bronx in 2004. She's an alumni of News 12 New Jersey. She worked there from 2004 to 2012. And after a very, very brief stint at Fox 5 New York, she went, her, she went on to CBS New York, I should say, in 2013, where she has been ever since. And that is Emmy Award winning and Emmy nominated anchor and reporter Alice Gaynor, who joins us now on the Mike the Raven podcast. Uh, Alice, welcome. How are you? Thank you for being here. I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. With that music for your intro, I half expected you to like come down from the ceiling or something very, you know, spy James Bond esque. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't have that kind of cachet. You know, swag, swag, and I are, don't go don't go hand in hand. The better you get to know me, the more you'll understand that. So we were talking off the air that you grew up in Wayne, New Jersey, only 25 mm -hmm. minutes from the city. Uh, so why don't you give us the if there's no traffic. <laughs> if there's no traffic. traffic. Yeah. So I grew up close proximity to New York City. So New York City was always like a second home. But I grew up in Wayne and great town to grow up in. Um, was afforded all kinds of opportunities, you know, did Girl Scouts, soccer teams, gymnastics. My parents had me just involved in any and everything available, you know, at the library, at the municipal building. I mean, they really took advantage of everything the town you know could provide to a child and they also my parents met in new york city my dad's from queens my mom's from clifton um you know they also made sure we came to new york city when we could to maybe go see a show i um, went to school of american ballet when i was eight years old here so um it's nice that i've been able to stay in the area <laughs> you know all these years as you mentioned almost it's just about 20 years actually it is 20 years now Mm, it is the thing. Yeah. Because yeah. I started in college. So right. at WFUV, as we'll discuss uh, during your years at Fordham University. So people understand early on some in some cases what they want to do. As I often talk with my FDNY and NYPD friends, you know, I asked them, did you always want to do this? They said, yeah, my dad was on the job or, I, you know, I saw the firehouse with the police precinct in the neighborhood and that inspired me for you. If there were any early inclinations of this being your preferred career path, who would you credit as the personalities in media that inspired you? I actually was going to college for art. Mm. So my father is a great artist. Uh, he taught me how to draw. My brother's an architect. Um, my other brother works uh, in finance, went to Naval Academy as a Marine. My mom's a, now a retired English teacher. So very you know, vast array um, of uh, jobs in my family. So I was going to go to school for art. In junior high school, I started writing for the school newspaper at George Washington Middle School. So I feel like there were little hints along the way that didn't quite fall into place until I was in college. When I was at Wayne Valley High School, I took TV production class. I was a part of V, the, the Best of the Valley. That was our show we put on that was on public access. You know, it was like a newscast that was broadcast throughout the town. And, you know, despite that, Again, I was going to go for art. I thought maybe I'll be a fashion designer. You know, I wasn't quite sure. And I got to Fordham and I was declared a fine arts major. And then I started working at the radio station, WFUV. It's an NPR affiliate right on campus. It's an incredible station. And I switched my major to uh, communications and never looked back. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you hear some people say, Maybe they used to interview their dolls when they were little or whatever the case may be. You know, I guess it was always there in the background and it just didn't occur to me really until until college. 
Alice Gainers, our guest here in the Mike Demaven podcast. If you have a question for Alice in the chat, type uh, type away, and I'll make sure that she sees it at some point. She can answer it. I see my friend Boxing MMA 365 in the chat. Thank you, brother, as always, for supporting the show. Uh, you know, so that, I guess we can segue now into Fordham. The history of Fordham's broadcasting program is apparent throughout New York City, as you well know, because think about it. Michael Kay went there. He's doing the Yankee games now. Mike Green, the legendary NBA announcer who does my beleaguered Knicks games uh, as well. You know, I don't know what's going on with my Knicks, but then again, uh, you know, who, who wants to visit that topic? And also, she went to school with you at the same time, and I know you guys share a lot of the same friends. Lauren Scala over mm-hmm. at NBC New York, she went there too. So you see the the imprint that Fordham has. Mm-hmm. Working at WFUV, you know, and getting there as an 18-year-old in 2000, who would you credit early on for helping you learn the ropes? You mean at FUV or just? FUV. Um, you know, really, it was my mother. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't know this about me. I had a four-year Army ROTC scholarship for Fordham. And this was fall or really August of 2000s when you move in. So this was, this was pre-9-11. So I had given some thought when applying to colleges about maybe attending one of the service academies. Again, one of my brothers went to the Naval Academy. So I had sent my SAT scores to West Point and I had done a couple of things. Ultimately, I thought I just didn't want to go that route, but Fordham is very expensive. (laughs) So my parents said, I don't know how you think we're paying for this. So I was fortunate enough to receive this four year scholarship. But, you know, during my first semester, I just really, I just, I wasn't, I guess, quite sure my path, but I just knew that I wanted to do something different. So I convinced my parents to, to let me drop it. Um, and my mom said, well, you have to go get a job on campus. <laughs> so she said, the radio station is there. It's great. You know, go there and apply. And I did. And I started working the front desk area, answering phones, you know, that sort of thing. And then I took the news workshop and then started working in the newsroom from there. And I mean, it changed my life. I want to backtrack to your second to your time uh, for a second, I should say to your time in New Jersey, because as you were growing up, you were very active in athletics. You Mm -hmm. swam, you were a soccer player. And the good thing about participating in athletics is it gives you a great sense of structure and discipline. So how do you feel that it's positively impacted not just your career, but your life? You know, I really, truly am a team player. I'm loyal and I've been in the role of a captain in some instances, you know, not necessarily maybe because I was the best, but because I feel like I have an ability to know how to bring people together and encourage people. So I still apply that to my life. You know, what I do is very much a team effort. I'm not a one man band. I'm not editing. I'm not shooting my own material. I mean, maybe maybe once in a while. But I've got a photographer, I've got an editor, I've got a writer, you know, I've got people to work with and you want people to put forth their best effort and they're only going to do that in a comfortable, encouraging environment. So it's just really important to lift each other up. And, you know, there's a certain way to talk to people to make sure people want to do, you know, their best work when they're working with you. So I feel like Team sports, you know, growing up really helped me prepare in that way for adult life. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And you mentioned, of course, you were at WFUV and you were at Fordham during the events of September 11th. Now, for anybody that may not remember the makeup of New York City when the Twin Towers were still standing, you would just about be able to see them from anywhere in the city. And at Fordham, it was certainly no different. I mean, you were 19 when this happened. You went down there about a couple days later. I remember seeing pictures on your Instagram of this event. Being down there as a New Yorker and as a new journalist at the time, taking all of that in, what was that like for you? So, you you know, I remember that day vividly. Um, certainly no one, not everyone had cell phones then really. I don't even know if I had this cell phone yet. So I, you know, a friend's mother called our landline to say, turn on the TV. I was late to class. My professor hadn't didn't know what had just happened. We all eventually, I think, left class early. Cancels were classes were canceled for the rest of the day. Some people went up top to one of the buildings where they could see, uh, you know, the burning towers. And I remember there was a group of us running around wondering if we could donate blood. Um, it was just all very surreal. Sadly, I know, you know, friends who lost loved ones. I was very fortunate. I did not, but you know, these people were near and dear to me and and they lost somebody. So it was really, 
you know, it's really, really challenging. And even now to this day, when I do stories, um, I'm starting to get <laughs> a little, you know, it's, it's very hard to interview people about this topic. Um, you know, being here during this, that time, um, you know, this is the one story that I have a hard time interviewing people with to this day. And um, again, I was very fortunate. I, I didn't personally know anyone, but so many people around me were affected. And, you know, the one thing I remember in the days after people were wearing red, white, and blue, um, there was this real sense of togetherness. And, you know, those are the things that stick out uh, in my mind. Absolutely. And in talking with my, I get, I get it. Cause you know, even though I was one years old when this happened, so I don't have a recollection of my own, but speaking with my FDNY and NYPD friends who were there, I, I feel it through them. And I'll never forget my friend, a couple of stories, my friend, Tim Brown, uh, who was a firefighter in rescue three in the Bronx for many years, he's in the lobby and Terry Hatton, captain of the elite rescue one that you probably see cause you live in Manhattan, their company, they're best friends. Terry walks over to Tim, hugs him and says, I love you, brother. I don't know if I'll see you again takes his men up the stairs, never comes back down. And, uh, you know, my friend from the bomb squad, Kevin Barry, who I mentioned off the air, uh, was standing, he was with his partner trying to survey, all right, we're gonna get on the plaza, we're gonna get in there, here's what we're gonna do. And when the second plane hit, the engine landed feet from him. He had to die for cover. So, you know, it's, it's a story that there's many different angles to it, as you just discussed, but it affected everybody. And I think some of the best journalism, some of the best stories were told after because we painted a portrait of who these people were. It wasn't just who did this, but it's how the city steadily, as the late great Pete Hamill put it, got up like a boxer that had been knocked down. You know, so it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, important that that is not forgotten. So transitioning to a happier topic, uh, you were the captain of the dance team while at Fordham. <laughs> Which is interesting because obviously we see the sideline dancers at Knicks games, you know, and, and other basketball events and even football events as well. Uh, what was it that appealed to you about dance? So since I was doing this ROTC scholarship, I thought, you know, I'm burnt out from soccer. And the thing is, I was on a team in high school with superstars. I mean, I was good enough to be on the team, but look, I wasn't one of the stars of the team. I mean, we were county champs. We were state sectional champs. You know, same goes for swimming. I was I was a good swimmer, but, you know, it's not like I was getting a scholarship for any of these, um, you know, sports to go to school. And so I just thought, you know what, I really want to dance and try it out, made the team. And I've learned a lot of lessons, you know, through through the dance team, because we were considered a club sport, not a varsity sport. We didn't have a coach. We weren't getting as much money. We had to fundraise the heck out of you know, <laughs> our time there just to be able to afford different things. We took ourselves to nationals in Florida, which was a big deal. And, you know, we choreographed our own routines. We got to dance at Madison Square Garden when Fordham played St. John's. Just a lot of really incredible experiences I had. And just, you know, being the head of that team along with the co-captain, you know, you're in charge. You're the coach. You're the one coming up with everything. There's no one to look to. It, it's all on you and your team. So I was really proud of what we accomplished there. And, you know, in turn, I, I just learned a lot. And, and it was a lot of fun. We danced, you know, football games, um, charity events. Um, we actually did something for Tuesday's Children, which is a 9-11 charity. Um, so, yeah, I just, gosh, Fordham was really the time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people say that. I feel the same way about my years in college. It was great. Even if I didn't do any special programs, it's the people that you meet, you know, those are bonds that are for life because it's such a great time because you're really finding your footing in the world. You know, you're all grown up and that's how you learn the early lessons of adulthood. And I'll get to your career in a second. We're talking with Alex Gaynor here in the Mike and Raven podcast, but you competed in beauty pageants. You won Miss Somerset County in 2006. Now, when I was talking to my friend, Caitlin Monty a while ago, she was a former, I think, Miss New York. I was mm -hmm. like, how'd you get into it? She's like, Mike, I was a tomboy. So it was really a happy accident. So <laughs> I'll ask you the same question. How'd you get into it? You know, I grew up watching pageants. I had a couple of Miss America dolls, but it's not necessarily something that's big or known about, I think, in this area. I think you have to really seek it out. And a friend of mine who was also on the dance team and also worked at WFUV, she competed and was first runner up at Miss New York. And I thought, oh, wow, she's doing it. I, I, I'll look into this. I can do this. So I started doing um, the Miss New Jersey USA pageant for a few years, and I did... Um, only one year because I was going to age out. I did um, the Miss America, Miss New Jersey, you know, for Miss America, and you have to win a local in order to qualify to go to the Miss New Jersey competition. So Somerset County, it was an open 
competition, meaning you didn't have to live in the county. Um, I had competed in Bergen County and lost, and <laughs> but I won Somerset County. And, you know, say what you will about pageants. I'm competitive. It forces you to be the best version of yourself, um, you know, physically, mentally. For Miss America, you have to have a platform. So I did some volunteer work with the American Cancer Society. You know, you have to be on your game with interviews and, you know, just really know your stuff. And I really enjoyed it. And more than that, I made connections with people who work in the uh, news industry. And I'm still to this day, you know, friends with them. Uh, some work at CNN. Uh, another person works at CBS Philly. I mean, so really for me, what I got out of it were these lifelong connections that have been, you know, so wonderful. You talked about it, you know. Man, obviously, Miss New Jersey. <laughs> But you won Miss Somerset County, so it's better to have won something and to at least compete is an honor, you know. So, uh, yeah, of, of course. So you were mentioning it when you were discussing your early years in Wayne, and that is, of course, that you spent your entire career here in the tri-state area. You've never gone anywhere else. So you started out in News 12, New Jersey, right in your backyard. Now, the good thing is that you're in your backyard. You know the area. Mm -hmm. But sometimes as a result of knowing our surroundings and being so comfortable, we can be guilty, generally speaking, of getting a bit too comfortable and maybe not push ourselves as hard as a result, as, as if you were in a smaller market or any other market that you don't know and you have to learn. So if that attitude at all sprouted up at any given point, how did you combat against it? I mean, I don't think it was a detriment to me, you know, being from here. I mean, the reason, look, the reason I wanted to stay was I'm from here. New York is the number one market. And I thought to myself, if I could stay here, you know, wh why would I leave just to try and come back? And at the time, that was unheard of. Everyone was leaving to go to smaller markets. You know, I have friends who worked all over the country and I was in radio still. So I was working, I was fortunate enough to land a job at WBGO, another NPR affiliate in Newark, New Jersey. And I was working at Metro Networks, which no longer exists, but it's very similar, I guess, to the Associated Press you would compare it to. Yep. And then I thought, I don't know much about local TV news. I took a job freelancing as an associate producer at News 12 New Jersey so I could learn the ropes of, you know, local television. So I was freelancing at a, many places at the time. And I was fortunate enough that I was able to move back home with my parents because, as we know, living in the tri-state area is awfully expensive. And if you're freelancing and just out of college... You know, there were, weren't many places I could afford to go. So, you know, I'm very lucky that I was able to do that. And I was told all along the way, you know, no one's going to hire you from from here. You're going to have to go here. You're going to have to go do that. I mean, you hear all kinds of voices. And I just did what I wanted to do. And I stayed here. And, you know, thankfully, it worked out. When I was hired at News 12 New Jersey, the assistant news director, I'll never forget, I sat down and she said, look, I just want to be very clear. I want you to know this job does not lead to on air. We've had this issue with people in the past. And I said, OK, well, <laughs> on my own time, I worked with a photographer, Ed Hannon, Ed Hannon, amazing guy, you know, really took me under his wing. So the days I wasn't working, I'd still go to News 12. I'd ride along with him and another reporter, maybe John Kleekamp. Um, you know, whoever it was, Dela Cruz was always very, very welcoming and, and encouraging. And Ed helped me put together a tape. And it was, I think, a beta tape that I then transferred to VHS. <laughs> this is how long ago it was. And I had this tape waiting. And then another female anchor there, Chelsea <laughs> Cole, told me, hey, I think there's short people on Christmas. And now I had been there about a year. She said, why don't you go, you know, say something to the news director? So I went in there. I said, hey, you know, I've been here a year, you know, I'm a radio reporter. So I'm already out there covering a lot of the same stories. I made this tape. Can you take a look? You know, I, I can fill in. So he watched it. He's like, okay, sure. So my very first day on air and television was Christmas day. And someone had stolen donations from a church basket. It was terrible, but that was my very first story. And, um, you know, I was with News 12 for about eight years. I also worked News 12 Westchester and Hudson Valley a little bit until I was hired full time at News 12 New Jersey. And, um, you know, worked my way up. I eventually started anchoring and, um, yeah. Did I answer more, your question? <laughs> yeah. No, the, the, I often say the more the guest talks, the better it is. If you hear me talking a lot, it's a bad sign. 
You know, that means that it's not blowing. Your question. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I thought you did. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Health gainers are against questions. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's all right. Don't worry about it. So, you know, one of the best stories, it, you know, it started out heartbreaking, but the family has bounced back from it and has done something so wonderful since then is Janet Zielinski. And I think you still keep in touch with that family. So for those that may not remember what that story was, take me through what it was and the impact it's had on you since. Sure. I mean, whew, this family, what they what they went through and what they turned it into has saved lives. I mean, I actually it was one of the first few stories I covered at News 12. An 11 year old girl, Janet Zielinski, had collapsed on the field. She was at cheerleading practice and sadly, she passed away, covered the story, <clears throat> went to the neighborhood. And this is my least favorite part about the job, you know, when something happens, you go try and talk to family. They didn't want us there. So very respectfully, we left. And years later, I was reading about how they were pushing for Janet's law. And what that was, was they were trying to get a law passed in New Jersey. It already existed in other states. It would require an AED at schools and, you know, certain amount of people to be trained. There would have to be a list of steps to do because, an AED, you know, would have saved her life. She collapsed on this field and didn't have access, I think for something like 22 minutes to life-saving equipment. And it was having a hard time getting passed because there were some budget concerns, but it was just so crazy to think we're worried about the cost of this piece of equipment. I think they had lowered the price to something like 800 something dollars for each AED, you know, a bake sale or something could have raised that money for each school. Right. Um, you know, they fought tirelessly and it got passed. Thank goodness. You know, doing that story just really opened my eyes. We interviewed a girl who was saved by an AED in her school hallway. I mean, I actually bought my parents an AED this year. And, you know, it's a story that really affected me. And I think about them often. I haven't seen them in a few years. I was, they do a charity um, event every year that I got to go to a couple of years ago, which was wonderful. And, you know, you just wonder how, how people can, can go through the worst possible thing and, you know, come out of it doing something for other people. It was just, you know, this is why I do this job because if it can help one person, you know, learn something or, help them in some way. Or, you know, in that instance, I was happy to give them our platform. I don't know if it helped. I, hopefully, you know, some people watched it and got something, maybe some lawmakers watched. It. I don't know. But that is why I enjoy this job and do this job. So moving ahead to 2012, mm -hmm. you left after eight years there. You had a very brief stint at Fox 5, which is about a couple of months. And then you went to CBS and you're walking into the CBS Broadcast mm -hmm. Center. And you know the names that have walked through that building, either coming in for interviews or iconic news personalities. And you get the channel, too. And there's Chris Raggy. There's Mary Calvi, Christine Johnson, Maurice Dubois, Dana Tyler, Marsha Kramer. The list goes on. John Slattery, who we'll talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, you're walking in there to what is essentially a roster of all stars. Mm -hmm. How was that intimidating for you at all? Well, my first thought was I did it. I actually worked in that building, the CBS Broadcast Center, when I worked at Metro Networks Radio. And I our, our space in there was right across the hall from the Osgood file. Charles Osgood, a huge Fordham alum, who I've had the pleasure of talking to, you know, in years past. And um, so first and foremost, I thought I did it and I'm back. <laughs> And then secondly, you know, my family during Superstorm Sandy, we had actually been watching uh, CBS 2's coverage. And so I remember when I saw Lonnie Quinn for the first time and Maurice and, you know, these people you're so used to seeing on your television screen who've been around for a while and people really know it was like, oh, that's them. <laughs> so everyone was so welcoming. You know, I think when you walk in, you're a little bit nervous and defensive, you know, that it's going to take people a little while to open up to you. But I think I proved myself pretty quickly and earned their respect. And, you know, it's, it's, it's been great being there and it's not lost on me, you know, what it, what a privilege and honor it is to, to work for, for a station with that legacy, a building, you know, the people who've, who've been through those halls. Yeah. 
Yeah, which a few years ago, the station itself at the New York Emmys won the Governor's Award for that very reason, its legacy uh, within the news business. It's a greatly respected and iconic uh, station for sure. Now, you shared a desk where I believe you sat next to John Slattery in the newsroom. And John is not with us anymore. He passed away in 2014, as I covered. But when you look back, he was a funny guy. What's like the funniest memory of him that you have? Oh, gosh, you're just trying to make me cry today. Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to. I'm sorry. I'm just going to cry or I don't know what's happening. Um, oh, God, I miss him. So uh, he'll pop into my head every so often because he had this particular, you know, tracking voice, this cadence, and it just can't be replicated. And often if I do a particular story, I'll hear his voice tracking in. I'll think, oh, gosh, I would have loved to have, you know, heard his version of this story. But so funny and so sarcastic. And if you know me, I'm really sarcastic. And you may have gotten a taste of that during the nine o'clock newscast. <laughs> yep. But, um, you know, so he'd be sarcastic and I'd be sarcastic and we would just kind of try and outdo each other. But there was one day I had a necklace that was all tangled and he took it and said, you know, let me do it. And he had a a safety pin and he, you know, <laughs> my necklace for me and I have a picture of him. And it's just, I don't know, it's so funny to see him you know, this crime reporter, serious, and he's just untangling this necklace for me. And it was just, it was sweet and it was funny. And I was so fortunate to sit next to him. You know, he shared bits and pieces of his life with me, the bride, as he affectionately called his wife, his grandchildren. And I've on social media, I've been able to stay, you know, following and in touch with, with a couple of them to, to still see them, you know, growing up. And, uh, and it was just funny because there was <laughs> one of our last interactions, you know, in, in the month before he passed, he had been showing me how he was trying to reconnect with old childhood friends and he was, you know, researching and looking up people. And I'm like, John, are you stalking people? And uh, he just, you know, gave me a look, but yeah. Oh God, I miss him. Yeah. Very yeah, good. He, he was the best. He was the best. He was a great mm -hmm. reporter. And, and as, as I told Alex, and as I told our mutual friend, Lou Young a while ago, that was the, when you think of New York reporters, like quintessential New York city reporters, you certainly think of, John Slattery. Mm -hmm. So you uh, you mentioned the news at nine, and I'm, I know I'm speed running through all these topics, but you're short on time, so I don't want to keep you too mm -hmm. long. But uh, you anchored the news at nine for years on WLNY, uh, the sister station of CBS with Dick Brennan. I loved the chemistry you guys had. Oh. Because as I mentioned before, <laughs> oh, you're, you're quite welcome. Because, you know, as I mentioned before, with other guests, you can tell when it's forced. Mm -hmm. You know, the viewers aren't stupid. They know when it's forced. They can tell when it's real. And I could tell, oh, they get along just, I could tell if the cameras were off, they would be having the exact same conversation that they're having right now. So working with Dick, how did he not only bring out the best in you, not only as an anchor, but also as a person? Gosh, so I look at Dick as another older brother. You know, he always has my back and we're just very comfortable with one another. He's a true friend. We both went to Fordham. Uh, you know, he's from Queens. My dad grew up in Queens. I just, I don't know. I, I feel like we get each other. His family is lovely and we're just, we were always very real with each other. And I feel like we were really ourselves too, during that newscast, that newscast at times could be a little bit lighter. So, you know, and then you throw Lonnie in and it's totally off the rails, yeah. but, <laughs> but, you know, he's such a genuinely good person and has, your best interest at heart. I mean, maybe part of that is also because he, he's the father of two daughters, but you know, he, um, and when you work with someone for long enough, you start to know and you know when that person's going to talk and you just develop this rhythm, you know, when you're anchoring together. But, you know, sadly, we don't anchor together anymore because they did away with that newscast in its, you know, old format. But um, we're still very good friends. You know, we both still work at WCBS. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll get to anchor again soon. Uh, together because I do miss it. Yeah, he's you know super easy to work with. We're going to start a petition, and our signatures will be the first two to bring that <laughs> back as soon as this podcast is over. I'm going to get this done. Uh, that, that being said, you know, as a reporter, this is the one thing I'm trying to figure out because when I talk to my NYPD friends and FDNY friends, you know, I don't have any sources. I don't, and I joked about that with John Miller. I'm like, how did you get the sources? So for you, I mean, listen, there's that hesitance, not just with first res the first responder community, but anywhere. Uh, I'm not going to tell you, you're the media. But then again, you break that barrier down and slowly but surely you gain that trust. You give something, they give something. How has how have you gone about developing sources? What has helped you? You know, I think people have all different ways of doing it. You know, an old method was people would just ask people to go to lunch and and, you know, I've never done that. Um, I think it's just through 
running into people multiple times, talking to people, they see your work, you do build up a certain level of trust. And it really just comes with maybe going that extra minute to just, you see someone standing over somewhere at a news event, um, you know, a scene, you just go over, you start talking to them. And, you know, maybe you don't demand something from them in that moment, but you keep in touch with them. And then you build sort of a rapport and they'll be more inclined to share something with you. And sources can come from the, you know, places you, you didn't expect. I mean, sometimes someone can contact you, you know, don't always brush them off because you don't know who they know and, and all of that. And, um, you know, so, so I think it's just about really <clears throat> talking with people and building relationships, even if they, you know, ignore you the first time, you know, you just keep at it and eventually they'll, they'll respond to you. No, of course. Like we were talking about off the air for, for a little bit of inside baseball. This interview is that I'm doing with Alice Gaynor today is like five years in the making because I first reached out to her all the way back. I kid you not in 2017. Did you? And yeah. Yep. I remember it well. I was with another blog at the time. It was called Gotham Sports Network, which I've since left. Oh. I'm on my own now. But that was almost five years ago. I think it was November because it was it was November because it was around the time of the New York City Marathon. And five years later, even though I joked off the air, she's going to file a restraining order against me as soon as this podcast is done. She's sitting here. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it worked. So, it, you know, definitely. And, and a little side example is, you know, for my Bomb Squad miniseries, I did a show a few weeks ago on this incident at the United Nations in 1997, where there were four letter bombs that the Bomb Squad had to go and dispose of. And to your point, guys off the air, not on the air, were calling me up and saying, here's what I know about that case. And here's what I could tell you happened X, Y, and Z. So I'm, I'm beginning to have that. And it was by, it was a happy accident. You know, I didn't um, reach out, but they reached out to me. And that's why, why I love what you just mentioned about don't turn away the phone call because you don't know until mm -hmm. you talk to that person. So you've won numerous Emmys. You saw the thumbnail to this uh, podcast. It's you holding an Emmy and accepting at the New York Emmy Awards. That first Emmy that you won, here you are. Here's that recognition. And so many great anchors and reporters have held the same award. What did that mean to you? Well, first of all, I my first Emmy was for exploding manholes <laughs> in Brooklyn. <laughs> no one was hurt. That's why I can joke. Okay. Um, but, you know, that was years of hard work. I was first nominated in 2008. I did not win. But just having that taste of, wow, somebody recognized that my work was good enough to even be considered. I wanted to win one and I didn't win one until 2014. So that was, you know, <laughs> stretch there, but I kept at it. And so winning that first award was just, it meant so much because it was just, it wasn't just that story. It was just the years of hard work to get to that moment. And I mean, look at the end of the, the day, these things, they don't, they don't mean, you know, that much, but you know, that first award, you know, maybe there's moments you've doubted yourself just, just to have somebody, you know, judges or somebody say, yep. yeah, your story was the best one out of this bunch. You know, it was it was a good feeling. And I remember you posting on your and I joked with you about it on Instagram a few weeks ago when you posted that the Emmys had come in the mail. And there's like three of them. I'm like, this is one of the hardest flexes I've seen in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do, don't mind me. This little box here. Oh, what do we have here? Three Emmy Awards. But, uh, you know, one of them that you won was for a story we'll get to now, 2019. Uh, the Jersey City shootout. It's one thing to get there after something has happened, but you were there during, and you could hear the gunfire in the background. Mm -hmm. So you know, here are the police shooting out, shooting it out with these two heavily armed individuals, and you know that the detective Seals has been shot. He hadn't died yet. He was gravely injured in the hospital, and more people were hurt and ultimately killed in the store where the shootout took place. Being there as it's happening, I don't know how else to ask the question. How the heck did you stay so calm? You know, I, gosh, I remember that so vividly. First of all, our first responders are tremendous. You know, we were at a safe distance. Well, I mean, when we got there, we didn't know what was going on, but we were obviously at a safe distance. They were all running towards it. So I got to say, first, first and foremost, I mean, incredible to run towards that and to be, you know, tr trying to help and save people. We got there. We had actually been in central Jersey doing a fun light story at a diner, got the call. We hightailed it out of there and drove to Jersey City. Literally the only line of information we had going into this was an officer may have been shot. That's it. We didn't know anything else. So we pulled up to the area and we got out of the car and immediately heard 
gunfire, not just one or two shots, rapid gunfire. And I was with two photographers that day, which is unusual because during the day, usually we're just paired with one. And one of them looked at me and was like, we got to get out of here. And the other photographer and I looked at each other and we're like, we were trying to assess, well, we didn't even know what was going on, right? <clears throat> so I looked and I saw an officer kind of blocking the street and I thought, well, and there were people standing outside kind of, you know, people who lived in the neighborhood watching. So I'm like, well, if they're out here, maybe we're probably fine. So I said, you can go if you want. You know, our station tells us if you feel unsafe, leave. No questions asked. But um, we all, all three of us stayed and we heard, again, more gunfire. And the thing was, it was echoing. So we didn't even know where it was coming from. It sounded like it was coming from here. It sounded like it was coming from here. We saw drones above us. I saw a, hell, a chopper and I had been in Jersey City once before during a manhunt. So I knew they were looking for somebody. So I'm like, I don't know. Is there somebody on the building? You know, we didn't know. But you just feel like you're there. You have a job to do. You know, we, we didn't know if we were in danger, but I didn't in that moment feel like we were necessarily in immediate danger. So we stayed. But I will say there are only two times in my career I've ever texted my family just in case. One, I was flying in a B-17 bomber. I remember that story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was like, I don't know if I should be going in this plane. So I texted, you know, I think my parents real quick, like, hey, just in case, love you guys. And then, um, you know, in this moment, I texted my family and I said, hey, I just want you to know where I am. I'm okay. But, you know, I just want to let you know this is where I am. And of course, everyone's like, leave. Don't don't stay there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, thankfully, where we were, we were okay. But, you know, those initial moments, we like I said, we had that one piece of information. We're hearing gunshots. We don't know where they're coming from. And we're seeing this commotion, this search above us. So, you know, that I, I'm not a war correspondent. <clears throat> not reported overseas. So that was my first experience walking into the most active scene I've ever, you know, experienced. And you're braver than I am, because as soon as I hear the first gunshot, well, folks, it's been nice knowing it. Back to New York, because I'm not, I'm not staying there for and that. Would but... you do that. And that would be yeah. totally, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we're lucky nothing happened. It, you know, in hindsight, if something happened, that would have you know, been awfully stupid of us to. Uh, no, of course, you know, I mean, I, 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 not about that, but I joked about it with somebody off the air. I'm like, someone, something like that happens. Yeah, I'll be easy, and you know, <laughs> and I'm out of there. But you did a great job. Jessica Layton was there too. I believe Hazel Sanchez might have been there too. I'm not sure, but all you guys together uh, were great. And I know Jessica knows probably knows that area better than anybody because she lives in New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. So you know that that was a, it was a tough story. But yes, that the first responders did a great job. And it was so intense. The NYPD, I believe, had to send either counterterrorism or ESU, both might have been, out yep. to Jersey NYPD to assist. Was there. I, I, you know, I watched them roll in and I was like, oh my gosh, the NYPD is here helping? I mean, it was it was a response unlike, you know, any anything else. Yeah. And uh, thankfully, the police won, even though we've had some civilian casualties and obviously Detective Seals lost his life in the line of duty, the police took care of business and those two individuals are not going to harm anybody anytime soon and we'll leave it at that so the last couple of years have been difficult and interesting and intriguing and even a little bit funny because pandemic life has taught us so many different things and you've covered covid during its worst right now we're in a good pace you know hopefully it stays this way but one thing not talking about the sadness of covering it is you know we've learned different ways to safeguard our mental health you are a gym rat my friend you hit the gym <laughs> a lot so how helpful has that been towards decompressing? And what else do you do to decompress? You know, growing up very active with dance, sports, um, you know, working out to me is just something I've always done. And I find that I like classes. You know, I don't like to just go work out on my own. I find that boring. I don't push myself, but I love going to different classes and mixing it up. And really, I find that if a week goes by and I haven't gone, you know, I'm not as focused. So for me, it's not even so much about you know, like the weight aspect, it's more, more mental health. I just, I really feel better after I've gone and I've worked out and it helps me focus. You know, I usually like to start my morning before work doing that. It helps me focus for work. Um, and then it's also a good outlet too. And, you know, um, other things I like to do, my husband and I like to try new restaurants in New York city when we can a couple of times a month, I'll read reviews. We'll go try a new place and hopefully it becomes a favorite of ours. If not, you know, we move on. And I have some great friends, a lot of them from from CBS. And we'll get together and we'll do game nights that are absolutely outrageous. <laughs> I've seen this Instagram stories. Oh, my gosh. And I've never laughed so hard in my life. So it's, you know, it's those moments. It's spending time with my family. Um, 
you know, my husband and I are, are debating getting a dog right now, which, Do you it. know, um, Do it. so, you know, there, there are a lot of ways to decompress from, from the world and, and from work. And it's just a question of, of doing them. If your husband's listening, get the dog because my sister had a, a toy <laughs> poodle. I'll text you a picture of him later. And I was not a dog person before he came into my life. But if there's one thing I love, it's being a dog uncle. You know, mm -hmm. that, that little guy has stolen my heart. Uh, one more thing before we get to the concluding segment, and I really have loved having you here. It's been a great conversation is, like you said, you've been around in this business now over 20 years. You've done a lot of great work. Just what 20, not years? over, just 20. <laughs> just, okay, well, just 20. I don't want to age you, my bad, my apologies. Uh, you know, so what are some of your goals for the future? What else do you have in store? You know, I mean, my goal was to get to New York City. I'm here. Um, I had a couple of opportunities to do a few things for network. Hopefully that will continue in some capacity. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. You know, as I as I've proven, I, I start off with one goal. I thought I'd be doing art at college and I switched. So, you know, I, I just I'm here to do to good work, try and hopefully make some kind of a small difference in that work and hopefully continue that for a while. Well, we have a segment. This has been a blast called Rapid Fire. And by the way, don't sign off yet. We'll say goodbye off the air. But the segment <laughs> that we always leave the audience with is uh, Rapid Fire. Five hit and run questions from me, okay. five answers from you. Are you ready? I'm ready. First, favorite positive story you've ever covered? Ooh, there's been a lot of really funny ones. When you're an early morning reporter, you get stuck on some very random. Like I was ice skating once with a giant Mr. Potato Head, but that's not my favorite. <laughs> um, most recently, we covered the reopening of Phantom of the Opera. And Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber was DJing on the street afterward. The whole street was closed. All the theater goers were outside. The costume characters were dancing. The music was so loud. It's 11 p.m. at night. Could barely hear my live shot. We had the best time, the crew and I. And it was just one of those, it was like a New York moment you'll never <laughs> experience again. It was just, I don't know. It was the most fun I had had at work in a, in a long time, you know, because a lot of it's so serious. But yeah. that was just a really fun, fun moment. And Dana Tyler, who should really come on this show, by the way, uh, <laughs> she uh, she uh, crashed a live shot because she had just come yeah, up. That was super fun. Yeah, that was fun. Live yeah, TV is great when it, it when is. it goes, you know, well. <laughs> of course. Second, you're you're a beleaguered Jets fan, but you're also a Yankee fan, too, even though the Yankees aren't making, giving us much to smile about these days either. Uh, <laughs> favorite Jet and favorite Yankee of all time? I want to say Darrell Revis, even though... He went to the Patriots and all, and all that. There. So, so we'll just leave it at that. And truthfully, I'm all, I'm more of a ballpark food fan than anything else. But I'll go with Mariano Rivera. But really, it's just, you know, I enjoy going to the game for the experience. I'm not like a diehard, you know, Yankees fan or anything like that. But my no, husband's my a New England, you know, Boston Red Sox guy. Like, so, you know. We'll, we'll forgive him for that, you know. That's... <laughs> And my sister's in the live chat too. And she like, she's the same way. Cause meanwhile, I don't do this anymore cause I've grown out of it, but while I would be pacing the room, nervously sweating out a playoff game, <laughs> you know, it, that, that she was just sitting there. She's like, I wonder what kind of food we have on the menu. We got to go sometime. I'm like, Josh, I don't care right now. It's third down, you know? So anyway, shout out to you, Josh. She's in the chat and I'll acknowledge her uh, in a moment. She says same girl, same right here. LOL. Oh yeah. We went to Fenway park. I got him seats for the green monster one year for a gift. And I plotted out all the food stands and all the food I was going to eat. And then I got sick after because I ate too much ballpark food. So anyway. <laughs> Third, when you're not working out or playing or doing game night with your friends or checking out restaurants, what are some of your favorite things to do during downtime? I also love to go to concerts. I have tickets to Coldplay coming up in June and uh, Bastille. And my favorite concert ever was Aerosmith and Lenny Kravitz opened. I mean, it was like legends galore it was awesome. Uh, so yeah, trying to go to concerts and, and different shows. <clears throat> that's always fun. Fourth favorite bar or restaurant in uh, New York city. Don Angie. So I follow or I read restaurant reviews on the infatuation and they're always spot on. So when Don Angie opened, uh, in the West Village. We tried it out, loved it. Now I think they got, yeah, they got a Michelin star last year. Now it's like impossible to get reservations, but um, love it. It's so good. <laughs> fifth and finally, no, I don't blame you. Fifth and finally, you know, you've seen a lot of people, you got like a lot of young people walk through the doors, I'm sure at CBS and they're bright eyed and bushy tailed and they're green and they're trying to learn their way. And you've been there. So when you've taken them to the side, uh, you know, if you have, what have you told them? 
I think I just try and give people a kind word. If I just noticed something about their work I liked, I just let them know. Um, you know, I think encouragement goes a long way. I'll never forget the day I started at CBS. Christine Sloan sent me an email welcoming me. And, you know, I think un unfortunately in this business, you know, women are sometimes pitted against one another. So you worry that people are going to be competitive. <laughs> maybe not be so nice to you, but I was pleasantly surprised at how warm and welcoming, um, you know, the, what the women were at, at CBS. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised, but you know what I mean? Like everyone, yeah, of course. you know, was wonderful. You know, Christine was great. Um, so, you know, I try and do the same thing. Alice, this has been wonderful, but like I said, we'll say goodbye off the air. So don't sign off quite yet, but any shout outs that you want to give to anyone or anything? Shout outs. Yeah. yeah. Maybe my mom's watching. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or my grandma or I don't know. Just, every, you know, what? I, I like to shout out George Bodarki. I didn't mention him. Uh, news director at WFUV. He's the one who led the workshops. He's the one who got us coaching for um, our voicing and our track. And his voice is still in my head. I still uh, go back and talk to some of his classes at Fordham. I mean, he shaped, you know, helped, helped shape my um you know, my, my helps me shape my craft, you know, I'm using the right words. See, right. <laughs> much. anyway, George was a wonderful teacher and I owe him so much um, for really just getting me to this point. And so shout out to George Bodarki. Uh, my shout out is to you. Thank you for putting up with me while I bombarded your email and called you from not one, but two business lines to try to get this done. And uh, you were great. And I, I certainly enjoyed having you here. As always, shout out to our friends in the live chat. I'll shout them out in order. Boxing MMA 365. Thank you, brother Robert Bates. And my sister, Jaleen Michelle, thank you for being here and supporting the show. Coming up next in the Mike the New Haven podcast, as you heard me say in the beginning, it's a double header today. Alice was first. We're keeping up with the news team tonight. Rocco Paris Candola, who is the New York Daily News Police Bureau Chief, he'll be here uh, for episode 151. And this Friday, he survived one of the most terrifying shootouts in NYPD history. He was a member of the emergency service unit the night it went down and trucked three in the Bronx. I'm referring to the shootout in November of 1986 with Larry Davis. His name is Rick Martinez. And for volume seven, excuse me, of the Mike the New Haven miniseries, the E-Men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit, he will join me, Rick Martinez, for volume seven. In the meantime, on behalf of Alice Gaynor, I am Mike Cologne, and we will see you later tonight. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.